Welcome to another episode of the 8-Bit Guy. So in this episode, I want to show you how character LCDs work. Now, these things have been around since at least the 1980s. You can find them in all kinds of electronics like old computers, music keyboards, synthesizers, calculators, early mobile phones, laser printers, and are still widely used today on servers and for hobby projects with uh, microcontrollers. In fact, they are ridiculously cheap now and you can find them all over eBay for just a few dollars in just about every shape, size, and color you could want. They come in as small as 8x1 characters. Some other common sizes are 8x2, 16x2, and 20x4. These screens should all have either 14 or 16 pins on them. They can be arranged in different ways, but they should be labeled 1 through 14. I'm going to start by showing you what each of the 14 pins do. The first pin is ground, uh, the next pin is plus 5 volts. So these two wires are essentially what give the screen power. The next pin receives an analog voltage to set the contrast of the screen. Typically this is done by connecting it to the middle pin of a potentiometer. Then the other two leads on the potentiometer go to plus 5 volts and ground. So the signal you're feeding it will always be somewhere in between those numbers depending upon where you turn the knob. The next pin is register select, so the screen can accept two types of information. One is text data, that's basically just putting ASCII characters on the screen. The other option is instructions, which tells the screen to do stuff like turn the cursor on, initialize the display, um, create graphics characters, things like that. So imagine you had a toggle switch. You could hook up this pin to the center of the switch and then connect 5 volts to one side and ground to the other. That way when you move the switch back and forth it will pull the line high or pull the line low, telling it which type of data you want to send it. The next pin is for read write. Yes, besides just sending information to the screen, you can actually read information from the screen. And you have to pull it high for reading or low for writing. The next pin is the enable pin. I'll come back to this in just a minute. The next 8 pins are the data bits 0 through 7, which represent an 8-bit binary number. All of these pins need to be set either high or low, just like the last few. So back to that enable line, this is the final piece of the puzzle. Basically once you've set all of the other pins exactly how you want them, then you set this line high and that will feed all of the information into the screen. Also some screens have 16 pins, and those are just to accommodate a backlight, so that's just the power source for the backlight. I've hooked these screens up to all sorts of things, and I plan on uh, showing you how to hook one up to a Commodore 64 here shortly. But before I do that, it occurred to me that it might be possible to control these screens without using any sort of computer at all, using nothing but toggle switches. So I set out to construct such a device. So I played around with my design here on a paint program, and this is what I came up with. Obviously I'll connect these two pins to power and ground. Uh, this one for contrast, um, a toggle switch for the register select. Uh, the read write pin will go straight to ground because I'm not going to be reading anything, I'm only going to be writing data. And then I'm going to use a push button on the enable line. And then of course eight toggle switches for the data lines. So I went to my local Fry's Electronics to pick up some toggle switches. I could have gotten them a lot cheaper online, but I didn't want to wait for shipping. This single pole double throw ought to work fine. I would also need a push button for the enable line, so I picked this one. So here's all the stuff I picked up. I got this nice little project box to mount everything in. I'm going to use this 16x2 LCD that I pulled out of an old ISDN modem years ago. I'm just going to test fit the LCD screen. Oh, 
Ok, so here's all the switches mounted. This reminds me of an old Altair computer, only this will be a lot simpler. So here's the potentiometer for the contrast control. And here's the push button. I also have a nice little knob to fit on the contrast control. I printed out some labels so that I could better see what each switch is for. And here's what it looks like so far. Now it's time to start wiring up the inside. So I'm just going to use a big piece of solid core wire and mount it across all of the leads on these switches. Now that those are all soldered on, I can actually use the spaces in between to connect all of the other wires that need to connect to either 5 volts or ground. I'm also going to need a power cable. Since USB is 5 volts, I'm just going to cut the end off the, this USB cable. Then I'm going to wire up a barrel jack to the end. And of course I'll need a barrel jack on the back of the box, so I'll install that too. When I need a bunch of small wires of different colors, I usually just take an old scrap multi-conductor cable like this one, and strip it back and cut off a bunch of wires. Unfortunately, when I started soldering wires to the LCD, I noticed that one of the solder pads was missing and I couldn't solder to it. So I've had these little screens around forever and I have desoldered and re-soldered to them probably dozens of times because I've used them in a lot of different projects uh, just you know temporarily and uh, that's an unfortunate side effect of uh, continually soldering and desoldering to those little pads sometimes they can just pull right off. However I do have another one just like it so I'll use that one instead but it does have some ribbon cable still attached to it so I'll need to desolder that. So after I removed the ribbon cable and cleaned up the flux on the board I noticed that it was also missing not one but two solder pads. So I simply won't be able to use those. I do have another LCD, but it's a smaller 8x2 character display and much too small for the hole I made. So it looks like I'll have to use this larger 20x4 character display instead. It will barely fit. It does have a pin header soldered into it, but uh, after the bad luck I had with the other two, I'm just going to leave that in place and solder wires directly to the pins, like this. And once I'm done, I'll run some heat shrink over the pins, just to be on the safe side. I think that's going to work out just fine. So I've cut a larger hole in the box. It's not as elegant as the first one because I had too much stuff in the way this time. Now all that's left is to connect up all of these wires to the right switches. There is one problem though. The push button switch only has two leads, not three. So there's no way to alternate a signal between high and low. If you leave a pin unattached, it's called a floating pin. And that's bad because it can randomly pick up static in the air and alternate between high and low on its own. So what I'll do is attach a resistor to ground. That will keep it pulled low. And then when I push the button, it will overpower the resistor and pull the line high. So let's try it out. I've got a chart printed out to show me the binary digits for ASCII characters and a few sheets showing me all the instructions for the screen. But things didn't go exactly to plan. All right. So here's the deal. And so this is actually a normal thing to see when you fire up an LCD screen, just to have these little um, two lines kind of lit up. The contrast does work. However, I couldn't get anything else to work until eventually I realized all my buttons are upside down. All my switches are upside down. This is upside down. Uh, all these are upside down. So um <laughs> i'm gonna have to think about this for a moment so i want to turn on the display so i'm going to move to i want it on instruction so yeah it's actually going to be opposite of where i need and this should be the sequence to initialize the display and bam it works looks like we need to adjust the contrast a little bit so now we want to Set the data path. OK. 
Okay, now let's see if we can send some data. Okay, and one of the things you're probably going to notice is every time I push one of these, I get more characters than I wanted to. That's because of a bounce problem. So let's talk about bounce. When you have uh, two pieces of metal and a switch coming together, now it may seem like they touch instantaneously, but in reality they actually bounce just ever so slightly when they first touch. Now it's imperceptible to us humans, but uh, digital electronics are fast enough that they can actually see the bounce, and to them it seems like you've pushed the button multiple times. So what we need to do to solve that is add a capacitor to the switch. That slows down the transfer of power because it takes a short delay for the capacitor to charge and discharge, thus smoothing out the behavior of the switch. So let's test it out again. Alright, so we're going to try this again. Powered on, there we go. Okay, we'll set the font. And now let's try sending some characters. Okay, and it looks like our debounce is working. We're uh, sending characters without repeats now. Okay, so this is the inside after everything is done. Now it's time to finally screw the bottom plate on. I can't easily rotate my switches around, but I can change the labels on here so that the register select is showing correctly. Unfortunately, my data bits are still upside down. I'll put the contrast knob on now. Alright, so I've written out my name here. So one of the interesting things that um, I'm going to show you is uh, if you want to cursor around, you're going to want to set to instruction mode. And then 0, 0, 0, 1. Okay, that should let me move the cursor to the left. And I can change direction by flicking this switch and I can move it back to the right. However, instead of moving the cursor, I can actually move the entire screen by flicking this switch. Look at that. And I can uh, move it back the other direction. So that's just some of the interesting things that uh, you'll learn playing with this. And uh, you can see the contrast adjustment seems to work pretty well. So here's one final look at the device, and here's what it looks like in the dark, since uh, this particular screen is backlit. Alright, so I think this is a pretty cool little educational device. Uh, just, you know, learning how to use the binary information and key it into the screen is, is actually probably a really good learning tool for someone getting into digital electronics. Anyway, um, I was going to show you how to connect this up to a Commodore 64, both on the cartridge port and on the user port. Um, however, this video is getting a little long, so I've decided to split that off into a part two. So. Um, Hopefully you'll stick around for that, and, and I hope this episode wasn't too technical or boring or anything like that, because um, I'd kind of like to make a little bit more technical videos like this every now and then, but, uh, you know, I run the risk of going too deep, and that might not work for some people. So <laughs> let me know what you think in the comments, and I'll see you next time.